and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Welcome to Nosebleed Radio, presented by Paisan's Pizzeria in Omaha. Here's your host, Tucker Franklin. We're here with our guest, former Royals pitcher Mike Magnanti, and we're going to go ahead and start off with this question, Mike. How many announcers in your life have mis- mispronounced your name? <laughs> well, I mean, I, a fair amount, although um, even within my own family, we don't all say it the same <laughs> way. Um, I had a mo- my mom was an elementary school teacher, or teacher, and the kids couldn't say it, and so for her class, she was Mrs. Magnetti which is just different letters and mm-hmm. different names. My dad was a high school teacher, which is going to the way I say it now. He just said three syllables. My grandmother, the correct way to say it is Magnante. Ooh, this is Italian. I like that. Uh, right. The only person that ever did that uh, was Joe Garagiola. Really? Only one. Yeah. My, my grandmother loved him because of it. <laughs> uh, but uh, for me, it didn't matter. All that mattered is that if they were saying my name, it meant I was still in the big leagues. That's true. true. That's yeah. true. So who is the best player you've ever struck out? We were kind of curious. <laughs> the best player I ever struck out? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, that's a good question because it's not like I struck out that many people, and it's funny because it, and it doesn't really matter because um, that's part of the game, just like giving up a home run. Sure. But, uh, gosh, trying to think off the top of my head. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't even know off the top of my head. I never struck out A-Rod. I know that. He mm. did me pretty well. Yeah, that's hard and to say. And save with Puckett. Uh, but I did really, uh, gosh, did I strike out Harold Baines? I was pretty good against Harold Baines. I know that. That's a good one. In my day. Uh, but I don't you know, like I said, strikeout was not really a part of my game. Um, it kind of happened by accident. <laughs> uh, and so, honestly, I, I can't even begin to tell you who would be the best. Were, were there any guys that you just, like, you hated going up against them? You hated them walking and watching the batter's box? Well, yeah. I mean, well. The guys that I obviously couldn't couldn't get out. Um, uh, Mike Piazza <laughs> was two for two against me with a grand slam and a three run home run. Ooh, so that wasn't oh, very yeah. good. That's not good. Yeah. And then, like I said, and Kirby Puckett was the other guy. I I mean, I got him out a couple of times, but every out was hit really really hard. Uh, so those two guys were, were guys that were were not good for me to face. Yeah. Well, an out's an out though. So at least you got him <laughs> out. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So on August 22nd of 97, you became the 29th pitcher to strike out three batters on nine pitches. What was that like? Well, you, you probably won't believe this, but uh, nobody knew I did it, including myself. <laughs> uh, so it was a game where uh, I was just getting work. That's all that it was. Uh, you know, we, I, I think we had a large lead at the time where we were losing by a lot, but I think we had a lead. And... Uh, so I'm getting an inning of work, and I threw my inning, and the game ends, and I go in the locker room, and then when the game ends, the reporters start coming over to me, and like, what are you doing? And then they told me, <laughs> and I had no idea. Nobody else on the team knew. I have the videotape from the game, and they don't even show the last pitch. Really? They're, not, they're, they're in the stands <laughs> talking. They're not So nobody knew at the time that I actually did it. Wow. And so... Other than getting to brag about it with my friend Billy Wagner, oh, right, yeah. he was a strikeout guy, right? And I don't know if he ever did it, but he had never done it at that point. So other than getting to make fun of him for me doing <laughs> it, um, a real, like I said, I mean, strikeouts for me were really more of an accident. I, I didn't even think of a strikeout unless I had two strikes on right. that. Yeah. The three-pitch inning was better. Yeah, and, right. and I did have one of those. Who was your favorite teammate to be in the clubhouse with do you have any guys that you really got along well with or just made well it? yeah and i kind of mentioned him. billy wagner was 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 definitely my my closest friend over the course of the career you know and to continue um oh, but of course like when i first came up in kansas city um the pitchers uh, tend to take care of pitchers and uh the guys that really took care of me were uh, at the top was mark davis in the bullpen and then two starting pitchers mike bodiker and mark gubaza the who felt or at least and i do too the right way to 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 approach the game of baseball and then like i say billy has certainly uh, been my closest friend from my days in houston you know mark gubaza is one of the one of the great royals pitchers you know how did how did he kind of help you in kansas city a little bit besides just like mentoring you one of the, it was really just little things even in early so when you come up that was a very veteran team i was a young guy one of the handful 
And I, I remember one day somebody was, one of the starting pitchers was doing the bucket. I'm in the outfield shagging, and I remember Gooby coming over and just going, you know, little things like, hey, Mike, you know, don't have to do it. It's not a big deal. But it might look good if you went in and did the bucket for whoever that was up there, which, mm. which was no big deal. Well, I not only did I, I did it, but it was amazing how many of the veteran players realized it. And in the locker room, people coming up, hey, good job doing that for him. And all of a sudden, mm. you know, it made things, it, it made it easier to fit in. And it was just like I said, it was those little things like that, that, you know, don't throw your dirty clothes on the floor, get it into the laundry basket. You know, little things, you know, treat people the way they should be treated, not that you're the big leaguer and this is just somebody working in the locker room. And and I think a lot of it was that because you need so much help to be successful mm-hmm. in the major leagues. And that help, you get some of it from coaches, certainly. But the vast majority of the help you get is from your teammates, both pitchers and hitters how do you face somebody you can learn so much from a hitter on how to get somebody else out but they have to be willing to do it for you and if you come in and in my opinion and you're like over hockey and all this stuff they don't want to they're less likely to give you that but if you show maybe a little humility and do a few little things maybe a little dirty jobs here or there all of a sudden those guys are the guys that they want to help you out mm. That's awesome. Yeah. You mentioned that you're a bullpen bullpen pitcher. What was like bullpens like during a just a regular game in the middle of July? What would you do in the bullpen? <laughs> well, uh, every city was a little bit different. When I first came up, I was a starter, and I remember uh, the bullpen in Kansas City. Um, the 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 veteran guys would go underneath the stands. The uh, back then, it's mm-hmm. not as nice as it is now. But they had a, a room back there where the grounds crew guys had their stuff and they had TV. So I would never go back there because I, the, I was the young guy. Right. And I remember uh, Kevin Apier was struggling one day, and he kept getting into trouble, and then he'd get out of trouble, go back and forth. But I knew I was the long guy, and I was constantly stretching and getting you know, who am I facing? I'm going to be the guy in. Well, I never ended, ended up pitching a game. He kept getting out <laughs> of the jams. And the next night, the bullpen coach, Glenn Ezell, at the time, he goes, I watched you yesterday. He goes, mentally, you were in that game five five times. He goes, if we would have put you out there, you wouldn't have been any good. You, you were mentally fatigued, basically. And he's right. And he made me start going underneath the stands uh, and hanging with the, with the other guys. And he told me that he would take, take care of me. The reason I say that is, is that it is. It, it's very hard to focus for three hours you have to focus in bits and pieces and so when, when people see maybe bullpen fooling around or they think they're fooling around it's really just a way to relax and you know it probably best when i was with the royals uh, not the royals the the oakland a's i used to go to the bullpen for the national anthem and then we were allowed to go back in the locker room because it was cold and damp there and i'd go in the locker room till about the fifth inning because i knew i wasn't going to pitch until the sixth but when mm-hmm. i came back down in the fifth inning, I was focused for the sixth, seventh, and eighth on who, what was, what the situation, what was coming up. And as I was starting to focus, those long guys were now screwing around. You know, right, their day, right. their day was kind of done. And then got to the ninth, my period's kind of over unless we go extra inning. Mm-hmm. And then the closer. And so you know, there's a lot of fun, and and every place you can do different things, talk to different people, or talk to people in the stands in Oakland because they're right there next to you. Yeah. But I can tell you this much, those guys have a good idea when, when it's their chance to pitch, and really watch them, you'll see guys fooling around at different points in the game, and then all of a sudden, somebody will stop having a good time or stop relaxing, and then they start getting intent for a little bit, and then when their period ends, another guy does it. Hmm. That's, pre- that's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, that's a super interesting point. I think a lot of people, they don't understand that aspect of it where you're, you do have to keep yourself loose and like keep yourself focused, but at the same time, you got to be able to have fun back there when you're in the bullpen so you're not stressed out for the full nine innings. Well, you, yeah, you absolutely do. I remember there was a point in Kansas City, we used to have sunflower seed wars. We'd be flicking <laughs> seeds at each other. But that never occurred in the seventh inning. It never no. occurred, occurred in a one-run game. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean... You know, baseball long, and and you like I said, it's very hard. I think for anybody in any situation to focus that much for that long, you know, for three plus hours, it's, it's very hard for anybody to do that and be really successful. You have to learn how to focus over short periods of time when you can do it, and I think that's what players learn to do over time. And hitters are the same way, by the way. Yeah. And when they're in the when they're not coming up to hit and they're on the bench. Now they're fooling around too, or whatever, or not as focused at least. But when as they start getting two or three batters away, all of a sudden those guys start focusing in again. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you mentioned how it's different from city to city. What was your favorite city to play in? Well, I think uh, as a home team, as a home player, um, I'd have to say it was Houston. Houston, mm. um, a couple of reasons. One, we were very good. Yeah. Um, uh, the one year we had the best record in baseball regular season. At the same time, we were all about the same age, um, which was kind of unique. You know, we weren't really young, but nobody was really old. You know, either. You know, most of a lot of in Kansas City, it was all over the map. You know, we started very old with a few young guys. By the end, we were very young mm. everywhere. You know, Oakland. Um, they had a, I was an old guy in Oakland. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of guys that were like 23, 24 years old. Not that that's bad by any stretch, but when you have this unique little group of 25 guys that are all within three or four or five years of each other, we all had uh, young kids. You know, that's when my oldest son was born, but there was a ton of young kids, and then we're good at the same time. That uh, makes things kind of nice. Right. right. Do you have a least favorite city to play in, like maybe on away games? Well, I have a definitely a least favorite park to pitch in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, for me, it was easy. It was Fenway. Much as I like yeah. Fenway, I didn't want to pitch there. Uh, if you looked at my ERA there, it's like double the, the next closest. Grace, great city. Love the city. Um, but I didn't want to pitch there, that's for sure. <laughs> and on the opposite end of Baltimore, which is not a good pitcher's park, but I love to, I love going to that place, you know, you know, to pitch. Um, I mean, as far as just visiting a city, I don't know. I think everybody's a little bit different, and, and the teams were different. You know, Houston encouraged us pitchers to go play golf mm. on the road. And the reason they did that was that they knew if we were playing golf, that meant we weren't staying out late and going to bars and drinking. That's true, so yeah. The, the Royals were anti-golf when I was there. Huh. Or we could play, we just couldn't take our golf club. You know, and so every team has different you know, rules, which is fine. Right, just yeah, follow, right. follow the rules that go with us. But, like, as a visiting player, when I was – with the Royals, the, a horrible place to go was Oakland mm. because we stayed in Oakland. Yeah. yeah. When I got to the Angels, when we went to Oakland, we stayed in San Francisco. It turned overnight into a really nice place to go, you know, yeah. type of a thing. So some of it also is just depending on the location, um, you know, that you're that you're staying. You know, if there's something to do nearby. Very true. And like for me, I'm not a bit. I wasn't a big nightlife guy, so it didn't matter. Like New York being open, all the bars being open until what six a.m. or whatever, that didn't right. matter to me. No, no. I like places that I could walk around. So mm. Seattle was one of my favorites. I could walk everywhere. That was a cool experience you get as like a pro athlete. You get to see a lot of America that people sometimes don't get a chance to go out and do. What well, uh, well you do, but you'd be amazed how much ball players and myself included for a lot of my career waste that opportunity. Mm. Um, it was a it was a minor league. It was one I got sent to the minor leagues one year, and the Triple A trainer that brought it to my attention. But he said he goes, "You travel all over the country, and you stay up all night. You stay up till three, four in the morning, and sleep until noon, and then get up, have breakfast, or have lunch, and go to the ballpark. You never see him." True. And once when he said that to me, it really I probably was at the right time to hear it, and I started going to bed earlier so that I could get up and actually start. Uh, seeing a lot of some of these cities but i wish i would have done it earlier especially yeah. with the minor league cities yeah. sure you know so we, we see a lot of we see a lot of nightlife in cities maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> <when it's dark. laughs> uh so baseball a lot of a lot of baseball players are very superstitious do you have any like pregame rituals or superstitions you live by or anything like that no i can't say that i did i mean yeah i certainly wore the same stuff like the same under stuff or whatever yeah. for the game but it, but if it only until it started getting wrecked, and then once it started getting wrecked, yeah, scrap it. I changed it. It wasn't. It mm-hmm. wasn't like a, it freaked me out if I didn't uh, you know, have it. Yeah. Um, which you know certainly, you know, other people you know, obviously had. Yeah, we talk about superstitions, and I know the starting pitchers are just creatures of habit. What was one of those well, starting pitchers? I think that's pitchers? what it is. I mean, baseball and probably all sports. You know, you're taught to do the same. You want to replicate everything. Right. And so. Then, the, the, of course, the problem with that is if you happen to have a personality that has a little bit of OCD in you, then you mm-hmm. can kind of go over the deep, deep end a little bit. What's your favorite baseball movie? My favorite baseball movie, to be honest with you, it's Field Dreams. That's a classic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it really comes down to, to one scene. Uh, there's a scene where, where Costner's playing catch with his dad. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? And so, first of all, his, his dad in the movie – looks very much like my dad did when he was young. I have mm. old pictures of my dad. So he looks very similar to my dad to start with. 
And I started every year when, when, uh, when you know, after in the off season, the very first time I ever played catch, every year I played catch with my dad. So it reminded me, you know, a lot of me, yeah. you know, and my dad. So that, that, uh, that, that is one that I, I, mm-hmm. I have a little special spot. I mean, it's obviously I, I like, you know, uh, the funnier ones generally, but, but if I had to pick one, it would be that. Now, another baseball movie that we like here is Moneyball. Um, how did how did you feel about that movie coming out? I was very nervous about it coming out. Well, uh, actually, initially I was in it. Mm-hmm. They had, they were they were originally going to do that with all of us playing ourselves. Oh, oh really? Wow. And we all had contracts. I I literally the the night before I was getting a call on a Saturday night. We were leaving on next morning, and we were flying to Phoenix for spring training. Oh wow! Really? For the movie. That's crazy. And st- Steven Soderbergh was going to be the director, and I got the phone call, and it wasn't the one I was expecting, which was where oh. to go. It was the one to t- to say that Sony got nervous and pulled the plug, mm, really, <laughs> because we weren't because we weren't actors. Sure, right? you're baseball right. players. Um, as far as the movie went, I was very nervous going into it. If you read the book, you know the chapter related to me is not super flattering, right? Um, in terms of you know, it, it well, and and there's some miss uh, or falsehoods in there it says that i when they got rid of me when they uh, released me i lost my pension that wasn't true um it said that i was uh I, there were a lot of people that read in there that it made it sound like i didn't belong in the game i don't know if that's true i, I never really read the whole book so mm-hmm. there was a little bit of nervousness watching it really because my kids were in school at the time and so sure. how was that going to go over yeah. for them as far as the way they treated my situation i was perfectly fine with it um there was no suggestion of that. I got released, which is truly what happened. You know, as far as the movie goes, I, I, I mean, I dis- I don't think it's it's factual mm-hmm. as far as the pieces that were put together, the things like that. They, they, uh, you know, they merged about three or four years of stuff into one season. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, you know, it's what they did, and I know that that's the way movies work. So, as far as that went, yeah, I, I came out smelling fine. You know, my, I always know when it comes on because my students will ask me about it whenever it comes on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, you know, they, they, and I get that's what they have to do. They, they, they put a lot of things together that happened over a lo- pretty long period of time. Right. And unfortunately, I think they did a disservice to the hitters of that team. Mm-hmm. They were really, and they made it sound like all they wanted to do was walk. That was the purpose was to, to take pitches to get good counts so they could actually crush the ball. Right. You know, we had three unbelievable young pitchers and and Mulder, Hudson, and Zito. They never get mentioned in the movie. You know, so Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, it was a movie that looked at one facet only of what, uh, you know, of the game or or of that story. Mm -hmm. And, like, for example, I think that their concept in Moneyball used to show, I I thought the best part that they did with Moneyball was they drafted so well. And it yeah. came down to some of those stats, and they never, they didn't do it that way. They only showed for picking up players, you yeah. know, cheap or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And your manager Art Howe actually came up, kind of was upset with the movie how it was portrayed, like your whole situation too. Well, yeah, and, and Art was a great guy. And I thought, and he got the worst portrayal of everybody. Yeah. Oh movie. yeah. Um, I mean, he he's a tall, skinny guy. He's obviously uh, the actor is short and pudgy. <laughs> Um, he's talking about never getting a contract again. I, I actually went back and researched a little bit of it after the movie, and, I, and Art was in the first year of a multi-year deal when that happened. He didn't oh. have to worry about, <laughs> right. you wow. know, about that. Um, and Art was a stand-up guy, and, and you know, I loved playing for Art. And um, you know, I mean, and the same thing. I, I think in the movie, you know, Billy releases me, Billy Bean. He didn't release me in real life. Art released me. I mean, it was Art's right. job too. You know, I mean, he was told to, I'm sure. You know, but I, I, I know that the movies are there to do one thing, which is to make money. Right. You know, and so they made, and they did. Obviously, they made money. And but, like I say, a lot of us and friends of mine that knew me, you know, the, I think the more people knew about the situation, I guess the less they enjoyed the movie because it wasn't exactly what happened. Yeah. You know, it's a good story though. You tested free agency a couple of times, uh, especially with this year. Some players have had a hard time signing. What do you think the problem is there? You know, I think I think you got a couple of things uh, kind of going on. I mean, I think with more and more teams uh, using the Moneyball concepts, right? I think that probably plays a fa- you know some some factor into it just gently, or, or trying to be maybe a little bit 
you know, more responsible fiscally. You know, I think I think that's going to it. Um, I think for some of the guys, quite honestly, I think that. I think some of the guys might have overstated their worth. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of three or four or five different things. You know, I think the problem when you get too statistical. So, like when I first started playing, they probably weren't using stats enough. Okay, and I think they probably swung around the too far the other direction to using them too much. You know, people have bad season doesn't mean that they're not going to bounce back and and play great or. Right. You know, or they've had an injury, or they have something you don't even know about, and, and stats don't talk about that. You know, type of a thing. And I, I think that there's too much of a reliance on it now. I think, for me, I think the Dodgers lost the World Series because of it. Hmm. The Dodgers burned out their bullpen in the first two or three games of the World Series by pulling their starters at three or four innings. And you know, the start, the relievers have already thrown a whole season, and now you have beat down pitching staff. That's just my opinion. Right, um, but uh, but I guess you'd say also that I'm probably fall into that old school mentality, mm-hmm. you know. Sure. But I but I think it's just a combination of a lot of things, you know, going on. Um, but I think that some of that is that they, you know, you have the number crunchers, and I'm not saying there's not validity to it. Yeah. Um, but I think sometimes it gets overstated, and but I think players also, you know, think it's time to cash in and. They want to get a five-year deal, but maybe the best you can do right now is a two-year deal or a mm-hmm. one-year sure. deal. And I think more guys could sign that way. So, speaking on statistics, uh, do you think that the save statistic has ruined baseball, or how do you think that has affected the game? I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any good statistic for any reliever. First of all, yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. A save when you if you put a guy out there with a three-run lead in the ninth, and he's actually he's a real closer, not not somebody like me that filled in once in a while. <laughs> sure they should get the save they're that good right right where if you bring a guy in with a one run lead at a guy on third and less than two outs you know that's tough but but i like i said i i can't think of a better you know better stats one way or the other i know this my when billy my friend billy wagner he got hit in the head in color in arizona we were playing in color in arizona he got a line drive in the head so he missed about three weeks and we kind of did a committee bullpen uh, closer by committee, but it was really two yeah. guys. It was myself and this guy Jay Powell. And for the uh, when those three weeks are over, there was one thing that I knew: I don't care what those closers get; they're worth every bit of it. Mm. The pressure and the stress was amazing. One, I didn't have that type of stuff to be a closer, and I but I found out that it was really nice to be pitching in the eighth inning, knowing that if I'm not perfect, Billy's going to come in and get me out of trouble. Yeah. But when <laughs> no. you're the closer. There's nobody to come and get you out of cl- uh, out of trouble, and so, you know, maybe maybe people think that they're um, coddled too much, maybe with the way the game is, you know, today. Um, but the pressure that they play under, I mean, there's no in between for them. They either did their job, or they're a goat. There's no, yeah. there's nothing else, right? Yeah. They don't get kudos because they got the save. They just did what they were supposed to do. Uh huh. Yeah. Right? But if they blew the save. They're, they're, you know, they're the goat. And if you block three or four, you lose your job, you know, type of a thing. But like I said, for me, you know, you always think you can do it until you get stuck out there trying to do yeah. it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And as soon as I got stuck out there trying to do it, I'm not I, – I didn't have that many opportunities. but I, And I think I had one or two that I got done, but I was like, forget this pressure. This isn't worth it. I'm happy to go back to the yeah. seventh. <laughs> Do you think, like, the stats and the saber metrics of baseball, because baseball is a really number-centric game, do you think they kind of influenced you to be, like, a math teacher? No, not, not from that standpoint. So I was a, uh, I was a math, I was an applied mathematics major at UCLA, and I graduated before I, was, before I started playing pro ball. Oh, wow. Uh, both of my parents were teachers. And so, you know, they, it was already kind of, kind of in my blood that way. I mean, that was not my intent when I got my degree. It was mm-hmm. not to be a base, uh, a teacher. I was going to go work for, like, IBM or one of those. Mm-hmm. Baseball, um, in other words, getting that time in and making the money and being able to save money, it allowed me to be a teacher without salary being, you know, this big thing that's sitting over our head. Right, you know? right. I think I always wanted, my parents, like I said, my parents were teachers. I always kind of wanted to be a teacher, a teacher. Neither of my parents, I don't like to say they discouraged me, but neither encouraged me to doing it because it seemed like one or the other was always, there was a possibility of maybe a strike or we were always, we weren't hurting for things, but mm-hmm. we also, it was very clear that we didn't have money to get, the, my parents never had a new car. We never had a new car when right. I grew up. 
we didn't have bad cars, you know, but there was mm-hmm. always, you always knew that there was money was a concern and baseball allowed me to, to, to get rid of that part of it. I mean, you hear a lot of stories about like, uh, pitchers and their relationship with their catcher. They have like, a favorite catcher. Did you have a guy you really liked to have catch for you when you were pitching? You know, I think on each team, you know, you had a preference. Yeah. Um, but, but having said that, I mean, as a reliever, as a relief pitcher, you know, you got no control, you know, over <laughs> sure. anything, and you're and you're not out there for very long. With the Royals, I had, I think I had 18 starts early in my career, mm-hmm. and I was always going to get the most veteran catcher at that point because I was young and he knew the hitters, you know, type of a thing. Right. Um, I think I think for me it would probably fall more to in the minor leagues in that sense, and and I think honestly it came down to how no pitcher wants to shake off. Shaking off pitches takes time. Oh, you want yeah. at least I wanted to get moving. So the more you knew a guy, or he knew you, the less you had to shake off. The more you're going to like him, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're and you're always having to balance really the offense with the defense. So you may have a catcher that maybe doesn't block the ball quite as well, but he hits 300. Okay, well I'll, I'll deal with a little bit less on the defensive side to get more on the offense, right? Because generally the backup catcher is a better defensive catcher than the starting catcher, at least when I was playing. You know the starting catcher can hit, yeah. yeah and yeah. and so, what's better? Do, would you rather have the better defensive catcher get a few, get some better stats but lose the game, mm. or or have the have the better hitting catcher and producing more runs? Yeah, yeah. We've seen baseball kind of evolve here lately. Rob Manfred has done some pace of play rules where we really think that he hates the game of baseball. So, <laughs> what are what are your thoughts on these new rules? Well, I mean, I don't watch that get too much into watching the rules like for example if they I, you know when they talked about putting a, a clock on the pitcher right okay great not a problem there's one second left throw to first yeah it, yeah all it, i think to be honest with you you could slow the game down even more right because hmm. as a pitcher if i was getting close on that and they're not they don't have the clock but right you're holding the ball the reason you hold the ball is to freeze the hitter mm-hmm. but if you're down to two or three seconds the hitter knows you're not freezing him he knows you're you're the, the, actually, the advantage has gone to the hitter. He knows right. the pitch is coming right now. So I'm going to stop it by finding a way around the rule, hmm. right? Yeah, and that could be a pickoff. I don't, I don't know. You know, you have to get into the detail. Could you step off or not? I don't, I don't know the the ins and outs. As far as you know, the whole coming out to the mound. I don't think that's that big a deal. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really don't. They overuse it, and of course, because of the stats. We're using so many pitchers in every game now, yeah. you know, which is slowing things down, you know, immensely. And I, I think again, it's back to my argument that every time you bring a new pitcher in, the chance that that guy doesn't have his good stuff goes up. Right. right? If you have somebody that's getting people out, they're in the big leagues; they can get people out. I don't care who it is. You sure. know, that's, at least that's what I believe. I don't know that you can man if you mandate if you limit the number of changes, then you've changed the course of the game. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, even if I disagree with the with the way they're kind of being run right now, I, you know I hate to see that. Um, I, I know that when I played, if you pitched on ESPN back back in the day, when there wasn't a whole lot of games on ESPN. The umpires would tell you, "Hey, Mike, take your time coming out in between innings. Don't forget we get an extra minute hmm. on commercials." You know, and so you literally you just sit. You know, most people at least, I mean, you only get like five pitches between innings. It's just right? Weeks. Yeah. This is this is only thirty seconds, you know, for five or or maybe forty seconds for five pitches. Some of it's uh, how much is that? I mean, so I guess what I'm saying is, if you if you could say, okay, we're going to do one minute between innings, I, I'm set, betting most pitchers would be fine with that. Mm-hmm. It's the commercials that wouldn't. But if you cut out a minute or two of commercials each inning, nine innings on both sides, you just shorten the game. Oh, absolutely, right. yeah. yeah, in a big way. I, I get it. I know that the money's coming from TV, and that's an important part of baseball there's there's no doubt about it but uh i think that a pitcher i don't think a baseball player is that stupid a ba- he'll find a way around the rule if he right needs to. right so that's what I, that's what i would have done I'd, i would have figured out some way to get a to get around some of it if i had to but I, they don't have to go out to the mound as much as they're doing it let's put right. it that way yeah you know they're doing it because the managers by and large are not prepared True. if the pitchers True. If you, they're, they're delaying to get a pitcher ready mm-hmm. right so yeah. i think that the manager may have to sp- to think a little farther ahead. Well, I'm gonna ask you one last question here. Sure. How do you think that you would compare in today's MLB? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I think just like always, I think that there's a good chance that the athletes today are better than they were when I was playing. I think they certainly throw harder. 
uh, than I did. I don't know that that's always good. I pitched whatever the so-called, I guess, steroid era yeah. Right? Yeah. benefited me because uh, guys wanted to hit home runs. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to try to hit home runs, I, I mean, I think in my career, going back into college, I gave up like a home run every 15 innings. So it wasn't very many. So I could use that aggressiveness against a hitter with my style of pitching. Yeah. Stay away, throw change-ups away, stuff like that. It seems that by, that a lot of guys don't mind striking out today, so that I could probably still use some of that against them, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, who knows? Maybe today I'd be better because more guys are throwing harder. There's fewer people that pitch the way that I used to pitch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I'm not going to try to say. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that those kids are those not. They're not kids. The people playing today are probably better a better athlete than i was in hmm. my day and, and i think we were better athletes than the people 20 or 30 years before us too as a whole i mean you can always get the exceptional and there were plenty of exceptions that in any right day and age, oh yeah right but uh but i think that the game has gone to a power game so maybe a little finesse guy like me that maybe had better command might do pretty well i agree <laughs> you never know well mike thanks for coming on i really appreciate it we had a great sure talk thing. here yeah, that was, absolutely, that was awesome. That was one of our best interviews, I think. Oh, well, thank you. Any, anytime, you ever want to do it. I'm oh, absolutely. Love to get you come World Series time. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mike. Sure thing. I'd like to welcome on Mikey Grinelli of Spit and Chicklets. Super producer is what they say over there. Mikey, how you doing? What's up, guys? Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for being on, man. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I'm happy to do it. So we're going to dive right into the NHL playoffs. One of the big stories was the Capitals finally do it, and they take down the Penguins in six. What were your thoughts on that series? Oh, finally, huh, boys? It's, oh, yeah. Yeah. it's about time. It's seriously, it's about time. It's crazy it's taken like this long for Ovechkin to make a, a conference finals, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's man. been, what, like nine years or something? Yeah, it's just, I yeah, mean. that's ridiculous. You, you, you see all the success Crosby's had, and then you just, it's, it's just crazy it's taken him this long, but. I can't say I didn't see it coming because I did predict that the the Capitals would uh, would beat the Penguins. I kind of wrote uh, Biz Nasty in in his reasoning behind it in the sense that you know no one's really or no one was really talking about the Capitals all year, mm-hmm. and yeah. that, and it seems like every year like they're kind of the talk of the Eastern Conference. So you know it, no one was really talking about them this year, and it just seemed like this might actually be their year, but. I mean, I, I, I think Tampa Bay is going to beat them, to be honest. Tampa Bay is a solid squad. I, I'm a big Devils fan, so I hate them more than anything right now. <laughs> if we finally get in the playoffs and they just crush us like that. But they're, they're so talented, especially on offense. I, I think it's really hard for any team to come at them. You, you don't have to play your best hockey for the entire series. Like, there's not a game where you can take a game off, you know, against yeah, the Lightning. I mean, yeah, I mean, this was the best Bruins team I've seen in, in years. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, the Lightning beat them handedly. I, I mean, that Lightning, and, and the the scary thing about it is Kucherov and Stamkos were held to a combined six points the right. entire series. Right. So they they essentially beat the Bruins without their two best offensive threats. So I, that's that's why I have them over the Capitals because yeah. I don't think the Capitals have anyone on their roster that can match up against Kucherov and Stamkos like the Bruins have in. Marshall, Marshall and Bergeron. So, I mean, now you got Braden Point playing unbelievable. He was the best player in that series. And then you have Stamkos and Kucherov who are going to be able to completely let loose in this series. So, I mean, Tampa Bay, they're scary. They're scary good. And yeah. the fact that they're playing in Tampa, obviously, you know, that's why people don't talk about them so much. But, my God, I mean, I was at game four when the Bruins play them in Boston, and they are just a, a fun team to watch. Mm. And they bullied the Bruins. It's, it's rare that yeah. you see the Bruins get bullied, and they bullied them. So they just have stupid death. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Going back to the Capitals, do you think that not winning the President's Trophy kind of took a lot of pressure off of them going into the playoffs this year? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's kind of what I meant when I, when I was saying that, like, no one's talking about them. Right, I just yeah. think, like, you know, I mean, the team that wins the President's Trophy every year, it just seems like doesn't end up winning the Cup. So, it's like a curse. I know. It's like when the Bruins won it in 2013, 2013 everyone's like, oh, no, God, they have the President Cup's curse. Because you, yeah. you, mm-hmm. you almost don't want it because then you have all the radio guys and the TV people, you know, expecting that these, that these teams should 
you know, win the championship. And, you know, then that creates, you know, storylines and headlines about players and distractions. And so, yeah, to, to, to shorten up my answer, yes, I, I do. Now, you saw that picture of Ovechkin after winning the Cup, and you could basically just see all of just the Crosby and all saying that he can't make it past the second round. You could just see that just going out of his body almost. Like, physically, he felt relieved. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's awesome. And and I'm not sure if – I mean, you guys probably played sports growing up, and, like, that's, oh, yeah. that's what you – that's why you play. Like, that's what you remember, like, you know, when you win your squirt hockey game and – you know, you ha- and, and it means nothing, but you have the same exact kind of celebration. And it's just, it brings you back to those days. And, and it's obviously so good to see. And, you know, that's, that's kind of why it would be, I've said for the past few years now, like, I would love to see Ovechkin get a cup. Because mm-hmm. yeah. first, first off, I can only imagine Ovechkin out partying with the cup. <laughs> <laughs> imagine how crazy that would be. And then oh, Ovechkin, yeah. his, uh, imagine what he would do when he has his day with the cup. Like, I mean, I can only imagine. Yeah. So I just think, yeah, I think if Ovechkin is so good for hockey, so, you know, the more we can see him and the more we can get him on a, uh, you know, national stage like this, it's it's awesome. The only thing that I wouldn't like about him getting a cup is it would ruin my favorite hockey joke, which, you know, that what, how do you make an Alex Ovechkin? So white Russian with no cup. So. <laughs> I like that one. I'm going no. to use that. I'm going to steal yeah, go that. For I'm it. not going to lie. Go for it. Yeah, it's a good I, one. I might tweet it. You might, you might have a limited time with it, though, depending on how he does against the Lightning. So That's use it quick. You That's can still true. use it. You can still use it now, yeah. though. Yeah, that is still, true. Still good now. Uh, I don't know your feelings on the Penguins or uh, Sidney Crosby or anything, but I personally hate them more than any team. Well, I guess Tampa Bay now, but uh, so I think I was almost more happy to see Sidney Crosby lose than I was Alex Ovechkin win. <laughs> that was that yeah. was a good day for me. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's actually weird, man, and and I don't want to sound like kind of pretentious at all. Yeah. But since I started doing this like Spit and Chicklets podcast. I've like grown to to hate players less and yep. appreciate and appreciate them more mm. because when I when I would say things like oh you know screw Sidney Crosby he's such a yeah. bitch like Whitney yeah. would rip me a new one and be like well screw you Grinelli this is you know the only reason I have that nice car out there is because of Sidney Crosby <laughs> so like you know I've I've kind of taken a step back and like really just appreciated how good Sidney Crosby actually is and. You know, for years and years, I've just hated hated his guts and, you know, basically wanted the guy dead. But now I'm just at a point where it's like every single night this guy amazes me. And it's and, and I forget who we had on the podcast. It might have been Taylor Hall that said it. Oh, but okay. he is he's the oh, he's he's a friggin beauty. But uh, <laughs> he he uh, he said that he's the best grinder in the world. Mm. He's a grinder who can score goals. And yeah. when you watch him play. And, and, and I say that, you know, like, Sidney Crosby, a grinder, yeah. no way. But then when you watch him play, he's unbelievable in the corners. He's unbelievable out front of the net. He he always, he never gets knocked off the puck. He's just, he's so fun to watch. And, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I hope I have a son someday and I will tell him to play exactly like Sidney Crosby because that's that's how you want to, to play the game. Yeah, it's almost not fair. It's like they got a cheat code. I think that's why I don't like him so much. He, he's just he's yeah. too good at everything. Well, yeah, and you he's in division for you, so it's a little different. Yeah. I mean, if you said you're a Devils fan, then, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a little different because, you know, I don't see him as much as you do being a Bruins yeah, fan. Yeah, for sure. Do you think that uh, – not do you think. How much do you think it will help the league now that the Penguins are out of it and they won't have a three-peat champion? Ah, see, I don't know. Um I, I um, see. I I don't. I I think that a three a three time champion would almost be good for the league because mm. again it will, it will get people talking about the league. Yeah. Um. And and at the end of the day, that's that's what the NHL needs most right now. Um. I think you know, like I kind of just said, as much Sidney Crosby as possible is great because he's so good for the game. Mm. But you know, the whole Crosby Ovechkin drama and Ovechkin beating Crosby, it, it's it's all good for hockey. So I think that's great. Um, I mean, if we have a, a a Vegas, you know, if Vegas, any of the teams in the West, if they make the Stanley Cup Finals, it's it's going to be it's good. It's great for the NHL. I mean, there's yeah. storylines with all three teams. Winnipeg, I mean, they have that crazy, crazy fan base. Uh, yeah. Nashville, I mean, God, it's it's unbelievable down there. Their fans are even crazier than Winnipeg. 
And then you have Vegas, who is an expansion team, which is, you know, one of the best stories in, you know, sports history. So, I mean, I think regardless, you know, now that Crosby's out, you can focus on, you know, the other stories like the Nashvilles and like the, you know, Las Vegases. But, I mean, I think Sidney Crosby's, at the end of the day, is good for the NHL. And as much of him as possible is, uh, is good. Yeah. And you touched on a little bit earlier the Bruins and Lightning series, and you said that you are a Bruins fan. What do you think ultimately just went wrong in that series? Uh, the Lightning were a better team. At the end of the day, I just thought yeah. it came down to, uh, you know, the Lightning are just a, were just a better team. You know, the, the Bruins, uh, a lot of young guys that just, uh, you know, they're, it's their first time playing in the playoffs. So they're, they, you know, weren't really ready. Or they put, I mean, you know, I've talked to a few guys, um, you know, on the team that have told me that, um, you know, they're tired. They, mm, they, and, yeah. and, and this was, you know, probably a month ago, a yeah. month and a half ago, and, and they said they're tired. And, you know, it's a long season. It's, it's so much longer than their college seasons and their junior seasons. And it's just, it's a lot of hockey to be played at, at, at that age. And, you know, they're battling injuries and whatnot. So, you know, I think just the young age, um, you know, they didn't really get much production from their second line, um, from, you know, Rick Nash, David Krejci. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the injuries was a problem, too. Um, you know, they had to play Zidane Chara a ton of minutes. Uh, because, you know, Brandon Carlo went down and then, you know, Tori Krug with the ankle injury. And, you know, I'm not going to blame the refs either, but, the you know, the refs weren't really helping them out in the series either. So, you know, I just think, you know, nothing nothing really went their way. And um, But, you know, the, the thing here in Boston right now is is people are upset, but people are happy because, in hindsight, th- they didn't think – that this was the Bruins team. And, and, and I, when I say that, I mean that, you know, everyone thought they were going to be a seventh, eighth, you know, a wild card team, you know, barely getting into the playoffs right. and borderline team. And, you know, they showed that they're one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference this season. And, you know, that the future is very, very bright here. And if they make, you know, a couple right off season moves that they're going to be right back in the same place as they were next, as, as they were this year. And, you know, the future is bright here. So people, people really aren't too worried. Yeah, I was going to ask about the injuries. Did you see, like, they released some of the injury reports at the end? It seems like everyone on the Bruins team, even the ones that were playing, are, like, getting hip surgery or something, like, immediately after the season was over. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible that they can play at that level. It's like, I, I, I was telling my buddy this the other day. And I'm, as a kid, as a little kid, I always dreamed of being a professional hockey player when I grew up. Yeah. But, but then you see what these guys have to play through in the mm-hmm. playoffs. Like, oh punctured God. lung, separated shoulder, <laughs> broken nose. Screw that! I don't want to do that. <laughs> if I get a, that's if I get ridiculous. A, yeah, I get a like a, a broke half a broken finger. I'm out for like six months. Zidane Ochar has been playing with like a broken or or uh, Noel Achari has been playing with a sports hernia since November. Like, are you kidding Jeez. me? Since November, <laughs> like that sucks. That's just not fun. And no, and that sounds terrible. It's like and and these guys are just like the toughest. SOBs on the planet. It's it's just it's crazy. Yeah, I think Riley Nash played with a concussion, wasn't he? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's just no one was healthy <laughs> in no, that series. Like, no, and it's and it's crazy that they're still able. to – I'm not sure if you guys played hockey, but like the fact that like they're able to play hockey at the level that they do. Well, exactly. When they're when they're this banged up, it's like what the hell? Like, holy crap! Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. I played hockey for like two weeks, but then my feet hurt when I on my skates when I was a kid because I was a pussy, so I had to quit. But uh, <laughs> it's like my one regret in sports. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough sport. So what were you what were you thinking when like with like Brad Marchand licking everybody out here? <laughs> I love it, man. I do too. <laughs> I love it again. Like, and I keep saying this, and I stress it. I I, sh- I put it in a lot of my blogs on Barstool, and I I say it as much as I can that. The NHL right now needs people to talk about it. Like, I feel like five years ago, six years ago, the NHL and the NBA were were almost, you know, they were cl- a lot closer than they are now. Mm-hmm. Now it's like the NBA is like light years ahead of the NHL. And that's because everyone's always talking about the NBA on social media, you know, on just because just you can see their faces and they're always causing drama. And, and Brad Marchand is just like that. Like, he's, he gets people to talk about the game. And he, he creates headlines, and, you know, that's good. Obviously, like, if he's out there, you know, hurting people and he's, 
you know, throwing cheap shots, that, that obviously sucks, and you mm-hmm. hate to see that. But, I mean, if he's licking someone, I could give a shit less. I think it's hilarious. I think it. I think Brad Marchand's the man. The man. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times. He's a great guy. Um, you know, in, in his postseason press conference, it was kind of discouraging to hear that, you know, he's, he's going to, you know, cut all that stuff out. And he said it's probably going to affect his points and, you know, how many numbers he's putting up because he said he, you know, almost needs to play like that to, yeah, right. to get points. And everyone's played a sport growing up with a kid like that that, like, just needs that oh, yeah. extra motivation. And, yeah. you know, Brad Marshan's that guy. And, you know, if, it, if it's going to cost him 15 to 20 points a year because he's not licking people <laughs> in the face, I'd be pretty pissed. Lick away, <laughs> buddy. Well, I think it's crazy. It's it's hard to pinpoint exactly what's wrong with what he did, you know, because like like you say, he's not taking cheap shots. He's not like exactly. really hurting anybody. Like it's, but it's weird. Like it's, it's such a power so, move. I think I, I what, love it. What's annoying to me is like the people that are like, oh, it's sexual misconduct in yeah, the workplace. Yeah, I saw that too. That's like, what? All right, you know. Uh, all right. Well, if if that if we're gonna bitch about that, then also uh, you're, you're not allowed to beat the shit out of people in the workplace <laughs> either and, and two minutes earlier two guys just punched each other's friggin lights in so I mean we, we gotta call, call a spade a spade here like yeah. what are we doing here now if, if that happened to you while you were playing do you think you would have been able to keep yourself composed enough to not fight or are you throwing gloves right away I think I honestly think I would have cross checked him in the teeth yeah. <laughs> I, I just think like that that's just my first reaction like, and, and, and while you were asking that question, I was kind of like, wait, what would I do? And my <laughs> first instinct is just like, you know, you got both hands on your stick. And I, I feel like I just, <laughs> I would just go right at his teeth yeah. and that, that's what I do. But I feel like when I got back to the bench, I'd look at the boys and be like, dude, that guy, that guy just <laughs> licked me. Like what? I would laugh about it when I get back to the bench. How can you not? Right. It's such a great move. I love it. I love it too. I love, not a lot of people like Brad Marchand, but I'm a big fan of Brad Marchand. I'm a, I'm a Nashville Predators fan. We'll talk about that game here in a little bit. But before we get to that, the Vegas Golden Knights, you know, what a run. Oh, it's amazing, man. It's, it's really, it's like I said, it's, it's one of the best, uh, one of the best stories in sports. It's, it's, you're going to, you're going to start seeing people trying to start, you know, NHL franchises left and right now after the <laughs> success that they've yeah, had. I real. mean, because usually you start an expansion and it's like the Atlanta Thrashers. Like oh it just sucks and it's just a pain in the ass and they suck for 10, 15 years until the point where you're like, all right, well, we got to move these guys out of town. And, and this, is, this is just awesome. And it's great to see, first off, how, how great the city of, of Vegas has um, you know, accepted them. I got to go out to Vegas a couple weeks ago. And man, every bar you go into, like the the bartenders are wearing Vegas Nights apparel. Like Dang. people in the bar are wearing it's it's crazy. It's almost like when I went down to Nashville, and I know you said we'll talk about that in a little bit. But when you're walking around Nashville, everyone's got the you know the Smashville hockey shirts, oh, and like yeah. you just you just feel like you're like wow, these people really really care about hockey, and it's it's just awesome to see, and it, it's just so cool when you. Like it, this is a group of like misfits, you know, it's, they yeah. were all, they were all, they weren't wanted. They, their teams literally did not want them. And now, you know, they came together and, you know, there was really only one superstar when this whole thing started. And that was Mark andre Fleury. And oh my God, has he been unbelievable. He's playing the best hockey of his career. Oh yeah. yeah. And you know, it's just, it's, it's really just so fantastic to see. And, you know, if they go to the cup finals, I might just, even if it's by myself, I might just hop a flight out to Vegas and just go out and just see what the environment's like out there. I bet it's. I bet this I, trip would be crazy for uh, Stanley Cup. I can't Cup even imagine. imagine. Well, even the games now, they're putting on like circus shows and stuff during it's intermissions. Just, like Vegas is such a crazy atmosphere for sports. Like I'm super excited for everything down there. It's insane, and the NFL's coming, so I oh, can't yeah. wait to see how that's going to be. But. Yeah, it's it's really it's really something special. I love when people said like Vegas isn't going to be a good sports town because they have so much else going on. I was like, this is like the perfect sports city because they have so much going on. They can incorporate that into their games now. Like like I said, with Vegas, uh, they're doing an intermission and stuff. Like they're having like dancers and all this other crap on the ice. Like they make it which is way more fun for everyone there. I agree, and and honestly, that's like an unbelievable point. And I never thought about that because when you think about um, you know, modern day sports and like how the, the, the problem, the NHL, MLB and NBA and NFL, they're all having is getting, you know, people off their phones and to yeah. watch the game and to pick the, pick, 
to pick their head up from their phone. Well, Vegas is doing an unbelievable job of keeping your phone in your pocket. Oh, my God, yeah. You don't even want to, like, remove your head from the ice because they have all these crazy, you know, sword fights and all this. People are (laughs) are jousting at center ice, and it's like, my God, it's like it's the the entertainment aspect in Vegas. It's like they capitalized on it, and and it's it's just like the. I don't I mean I don't mean to keep bringing up Nashville, but I mean it's just like they do in Nashville in between periods with like the mini country concerts. It's it's like they're capitalizing on their crowd, and they're it's perfect. I wish more cities did it. Well, you're also bringing in a lot of people who weren't like originally hockey fans too, you know, because there's so much to do in Vegas. Like, am I going to pay 500 bucks to see like Garth Brooks again, or do I want to go to a hockey game and still see some entertainment on the side? Plus, you know, see catch some sports too. Like, if you're going out there with your wife or something, it's easy to talk them in and be like, hey, you know, there's going to be dancers or something during intermission, so you can get best of both worlds there. Yeah, exactly. And I I wish that. (laughs) I really wish Boston was a city full of, you know, new hockey fans because there's just so many pretentious <laughs> D-bags here that just think think they know everything about the Bruins. And when you go watch a game, they're just, like, miserable the entire time. They're just like, oh, you know, Marshan sucks, Rass sucks, Bergeron sucks. <laughs> like, the kid next to me at Game 4 is sitting there ripping on Patrice Bergeron. And I'm like, buddy, like, what are you doing? Who are you, one? Second off, Patrice <laughs> Bergeron is one of the best players in the NHL, right. so... You, you know, you shut your mouth right there. It's just like, oh, man, these, these new these cities like Nashville and Vegas and, and even Tampa. Tampa's crowd is unbelievable. It's just like the, their fans are just so happy and, and, and they love the game. There's like a, like a tangible electricity in these, in these cities when they go there to play. It's yeah, great it, to watch. There really is. So Game 7 is going to happen tonight. Like we said, this episode will air Friday. So uh, let's do a little bit of prediction. Like, What do you think will, will happen in that game? Nashville, baby. Nashville. Oh, yeah. uh, I've, I've, like I said, I went down to Stanley Cup Finals last year. Uh, games 3 and 4 I was at. And I've never seen an arena like I saw the bridge. Like mm-hmm. the bridge stone was, I, I became like a, like I'm a Nashville Predators fan. Like I, I will say that till the hey. day I die. I will say that till the day I die. You know, when the Bruins are out and when the Bruins are not playing, I am a Nashville Predators fan just from that weekend. Um, I like to say that it was a mix of SEC football and Premier League soccer inside that stadium. Mm. Oh my god, it, that's awesome! It's you have the you know drunk rednecks of the <laughs> SEC football that are just going absolutely bananas, and then you have the chance in like the yeah. coordination of the crowd. Like the Premier League soccer, and it's like, like the ladies that were sitting next to us were like, "All right, they gave us a little card, and it's like, all right, here's what we do after goals, here's what we do after penalties, here's what we do, you know, uh, at, at the one minute remaining in the period." And I was like, "Oh, that's my fantastic!" God. Yeah, it's it's like it's crazy there, and so I just think that you know the home ice advantage is going to, um, you know, play its part tonight, and. Uh, I got Nashville. Uh, I got my boy, P.K. Subban. I like to say he's my best friend because, uh, you know, I met him when I was down in Nashville last time and we became best friends. So, um, yeah, so I, I got uh, I got the Preds. Who do you boys like? I agree with you. I like the Predators in this, too. Uh, obviously, Tuck does, too, because he's a Predators fan. But right. I think if this game was going to be in Winnipeg, it's a different story. Yeah. But because it's in Such Nashville. a different story. Yeah, because it's in Nashville, I think you got to give it to the Preds here. It would be a good game, though. Honest, though. Overtime. I'll be honest, I think Winnipeg might be a better team. I do. Like yeah. Winnipeg is a friggin' wagon. Like they yeah. are so good. And they're so big, they're so fast, oh, and yeah. they have so many goal scorers. And I I just think like they, they are the better team here, but just that Nashville crowd, man, it's it's something else. And I said that this the second the uh, the buzzer rang at the end of last season when Pittsburgh beat the Predators. I said, I guarantee you the Nashville Predators win the Stanley Cup next season. And I, and I bet they do. I sure awesome. hope so. I really hope so. <laughs> it, was, uh, it took a lot out of me to see Sidney Crosby bounce PK's head off the ice and throw a water oh. bottle onto the ice and get nothing. And I, I think that the Preds can win tonight. I really do. It just worries me. They've had two separate teams, it seems like, show up to these games. But yeah, they need the team that showed up in game six because that team. They need Rene. They do. They need Rene to play good. They do, but that defense in front of them really has to play well, too. If you look at the games that Rene has played bad, the defense has also played bad. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So how did you – are you from Nashville? How did you become a Predators fan? No, actually, it's funny. Uh, my uncle owns a bar down on Broadway, Tin Roof. 
Oh, he owns the tin roof? Yeah, he's CEO of it. Oh, all right. I got to get your phone number after this. <laughs> hey, for real. Oh, my God. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So since I, I like to consider myself a uh, – not an advocate, but a uh, ambassador of Nashville. I like oh, to yeah. consider myself the Boston ambassador to Nashville because everyone, ever since I went down last year, I probably get – no joke. I probably get one or two DMs a week of people saying, yo, I'm going down to Nashville, um, you know, bachelor party, bachelorette party. Where do I go? Mm. First, first bar I always say is the Tin Roof. Oh yeah, Second no bar, way. I swear to God, I swear. Second bar I always say is Honky Tonk Central, and third is Tootsie's. Oh. But, I, but I always say the Tin Roof. Now there's two Tin Roofs in Nashville, right? Right. There's one on Broadway, then there's one on Demumbrian. Okay, so I went to the one on. I spent a lot of time at the one on Demumbrian because uh-huh. I heard that's that's where the locals hang. It is. That's and a I local had, one. And I had an unbelievable time there. The uh, you know the one on Broadway plays live music twenty four seven. It's just an amazing atmosphere. They have the uh, the upper porch too that you can go hang out. You can see the stadium right from that upper deck too. Yeah, it's it's, it's really unbelievable there. So hey, good for you, man. That's uh, that must be a must be a uh, good time when you head down there. Oh, it is. I, I you know I really enjoy. It. He's he's got got quite the bar down there. Got quite the business. <laughs> that's awesome. So and that just turned into uh, you know just being a Preds fan. Yeah, you know, uh, I really uh, my interest in hockey started about a couple of years ago. I w- I was just done with NBA. I didn't want to do do it anymore, and and hockey was really the sport that I turned to, and I needed to pick a new team. I, I actually live in Missouri. I didn't want to pick the Blues because I was never really a big Blues fan because I think their fans are too pretentious. Sorry, but they don't have a cup. <laughs> um, uh, they're they're too pretentious to not have a cup. So uh, I went down to Nashville and caught a game there and that's when i i decided that 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 was my team right there yeah they're they're a wagon man they're fun to watch it's a great time down there so uh you picked the right squad oh yeah well what else can we talk well the jets you know the jets are just you you touched on it earlier they're big and they're fast and line has only scored one goal too and i think that's really the big reason that the predators have been able to do what they've done is they've been able to help line eight only one goal yeah, Ehlers is – I don't think Ehlers has scored he has, yet. No, Ehlers. he hasn't found it, no. Yeah, so, I mean, when you're shutting down, you know – I mean, Ehlers had, what, 29 goals this season? Yeah. So, yeah, like you, you shut down a 29-goal score, then you shut down a – what line I have? 40? 40 goals? So, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you shut down those two. That's 60-something goals right there you're shutting down. So, yeah, I mean, that's huge. That's that. That's probably what their game plan was, was to, you know, you shut off Patrick Line, you win the series. So, uh, I'm guessing that's their game plan tonight. You know, lock him off. Especially, especially you can't let him get on that half wall. Once he gets on that half wall, yep. and uh, you know they start working around. That's you never want to see that. I mean, I mean, last game too. I believe he had it was like nine shots on goal, and two, only two of them hit the net. Dirt, yeah, Dirt. that that's terrible. Like, mm-hmm. buddy, what are you doing? You got like, like you got to hit the net. That's that's what we're here for. You got you got to yeah. hit the net. So it doesn't. I mean, I, I think you know if Line A can score tonight, if Line A can come, can find the back of the net, the the Jets might uh, might pull this one away. I, I it worries me. It really does. I because yeah. I never know when he's going to be able to get it going, and exactly. I don't know. And I don't know what Preds team is going to show up. We really want. It's like Ovechkin. Yeah. It, it exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. We really need to focus on the Preds eliminating penalties too. From the, that's going to be huge oh, in this definitely. game, I think too. Because that, yeah. that's something they've struggled with all all season, really, but yeah. really especially in the playoffs. Yeah, and you, you need Subban, man. Subban mm-hmm. is one guy who, I mean, from his years in Montreal, there's nobody in the NHL that can quiet a crowd faster than PK Subban, and there's no one in the no one in the NHL that can get a crowd louder than PK Subban can. So, oh, for sure. I, I want to see PK Subban score a goal early tonight. And then do one of those sellies where he, oh, you know, yeah. does does the bow and lasso or does something crazy. And <laughs> man, if he if he can score early and get that national crowd going, oh, yeah, I, that's gonna be huge. Amazing. I'd live bet him. I would live bet the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a new episode of Spit and Chicklets out. You got a uh, oh, Biz Nasty joined the crew not too long ago. I was really excited to see that. Love to hear that guy talk about hockey. Yeah, yeah. Biz is a Biz is a beauty. He's uh he's been a great addition. Um, he's dropping his documentary May fourteenth. Biz Nasty does BC uh, on Barstool Sports, so everyone obviously should go check that out. It's uh 
five-part documentary that's going to be releasing over five days. So it will be the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th of next week. Mm. Oh, um, nice. It's it's unbelievable, boys. And, you know, I can tell you guys, as hockey fans, you guys will love it. Um, it, it there's really – I've never watched anything. Um, there's been, like, no type of, you know, movie or documentary ever made like this where, you know, it's funny. It incorporates hockey. It incorporates modern hockey players. It's just, it's really something special, and you know, we're we're happy to add Biz to the team. It's been, uh, it's been awesome so far. He has so many ideas. Um, this summer is going to be awesome. Um, he has a, a ton of ideas planned, and then next season we're gonna we're gonna hit the ground running with Biz, and we have a ton of new ideas, and it's it's gonna be fun. And you know, we we've already released a new shirt, uh, the Russian Russian gas shirt. So if oh, you want to yeah. go buy buy that at store.barstoolsports.com, we'd really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. So, who's your favorite guest? We'll wrap it up with this. Who's your favorite guest that you've ever had on Spitting Chicklets? Oh God, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I I was a big fan of when we had Taylor Hall on um, down in uh, down in New York City, but you know, over the summer, last summer, um, you know, we got to have Ike's on Jack Eichel. Oh yeah, that was a well, good interview. Yeah, I got to know him a bit. Um, he's a good kid. Charlie McAvoy, Charlie's a great kid. That that uh, you know, I've kind of become friends with Charlie from that interview, which is which was cool. Um, uh, who else? Keith Yandel. Keith Yandel was a really funny one. Uh, he's a he's a beaut. Um, you know, Matt Murley, uh, one of Witt's friends overseas. He yeah. was he was fu- Matt. Mo- I mean, uh, Motto. Motto was Mike Motto was hilarious when he came on. Um, another one of Witt's buddies. He's a longtime NHL guy. So overall, though, I'd probably say my favorite was uh, probably Taylor Hall. I'd have, mm-hmm. to, I'd have to go with Taylor Hall down in New York. I'd agree City. with you. He was uh, he was a really good guy. He you know he stayed and talked to us for a while, and you know especially after this past season that he had, he, he's unbelievable and he's a superstar. It's awesome. Yeah, no, I'm super excited for him in the rest of his career. Yeah, yeah it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun to watch. I mean. You, you guys robbed Peter Shirelli of that one. Oh, my God, yeah. That was awesome. That, that guy stinks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hey, Mikey, thanks for coming on. And, uh, hey, if you know you could help us out with getting some of those guys, we would be greatly appreciated. And of course, boys, of course. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, it was fun. I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll ask them, and uh, we'll see what we can do. All right. Awesome. Tell, tell the boys you said hello. Will do, my friend. <laughs>